G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a really exciting tutorial that I think will help a lot of um, Revit and Rhino users out, especially if they're collaborating. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice. So today we're looking at selecting Rhino elements by their Revit properties. So in a previous video, um, probably the one before this one, I showed you how you can add Revit data into Rhino models when they're exported in as an FBX. And also showed you how you can get these elements onto layers by category. So already a pretty powerful workflow. Um, this time we're just working in Rhino and Grasshopper, so no Rhino inside required. Well, the Rhino inside could potentially um, partake in this workflow too. So <clears throat> in this case, we're looking at the Elefront properties uh, that have already been added to these elements in our Rhino model. And we're gonna use these to filter and finally select these elements back in Rhino itself. So our goal is to filter the geometry and select only the filtered geometry. And we'll use a little bit of Python here as well. And that's because we're not just gonna generate preview geometry of the Rhino geometry. We're gonna select the actual objects in Rhino itself. And to do this, we do need to access Python. So I'll be using Rhino 7, um, not Rhino Whip, um, because this came out quite recently. I'm also gonna be using a model from part one, which I'll upload to my GitHub if you wish to follow along with the actual model set that I'm using. So let's just dive right in. So I have my model here in Rhino. I've actually went to the effort of using Rhino inside to dump in all the materials from my Revit model. Um, so I've essentially just adopted all the colors of the materials and in they are, and including transparent glass. Um, I might make a tutorial on this at a later date. It's not the most exciting workflow. There's a little bit of manual work involved. It's not all 100% um, automated, unfortunately. But in this case, um, you may recall if you've seen the previous video that if I select, say, this uh, roof and I go to its properties, uh, not only was its name, its ID, but we also managed to add some properties from Elefront. In this case, we had the category as roof, the family, the type, the ID, and we had up to three materials for each object, depending on how many layers or materials it was comprised of. So we have a lot of data already contained in these elements, not to mention they are still also all on layers by category but we're mostly gonna use the Elefront properties in this case. So I'm just gonna make a new script and I'm just gonna save this just so in case I crash and I'll just call this a demo. So the first thing we need to do is collect all of our layers. Now I'm just gonna put down a pair of bifocals so you can see the names of the nodes I'm using. Um, but to begin with, I'm gonna use the lunchbox package. Um, so I'm gonna be using two here. I'm gonna use layer reference and layer information. So in this case, I'm gonna be using layer information. Actually, I just need layer information. And I'm just gonna collect all my layers. Um, I'm just gonna get a Boolean toggle set to true. And what this should give me is the colors, the IDs, and the names of our layers. And in this case, our layer names actually correlate to the category names in our Revit model. So I can sort of use this to bypass having to get the Elefront property of category, which is quite useful. In this case, I'm gonna get a node from Honeybee, um, the item selector. And there's a few different versions of this node across different packages. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna use the one from Honeybee. Um, and I'm just gonna collect all the names and I'm gonna right click this and change it to a checklist. And this will give me just a big list of all the layer names. And I can select one, I can select multiple. In this case, I'm just gonna focus on my walls for now. So I'm gonna select my layer of walls. This will then send through the object that I've selected. Now the way that I baked in the data from Revit, um, unfortunately I didn't bake everything in quite the right way. So instead of getting the categories identity in Rhino inside, I accidentally actually wrote the data um, based on the Revit element, which gives me the prefix of Revit category colon. So I'm gonna concatenate this on to whatever I select. So I'm gonna get a concatenate node. And to the front of this, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna set this text as Revit category space, colon, space. And I'm gonna concatenate on the front of whatever I feed in. So now I should have uh, the, the correct representation of that piece of data. If you've done it properly, unlike me, then hopefully you won't have to worry about that Revit category prefix, but that's how you can work around that. I'm now gonna get a node from Elefront. I'm gonna get reference by user attributes. And in this case, we're gonna reference by the attribute of category. So we're now gonna obtain the elements by category. And in this case, I'm just gonna retrieve all those elements. And now I should have all the geometry as preview, note preview, not the actual geometry itself, but it's referenced. So in this case, I am actually referencing the element in, in Rhino itself. Um, so in this case, I can just turn everything off 
and I can now see that I'm actually looking at my walls. Now the reason why I didn't use um, another workflow which I believe Elefront has available, which is filter, is because it doesn't actually filter the object as a referenced object. It actually returns preview geometry, which can't be selected later on downstream from what I've seen. Anyway, I'm just gonna flatten my output now, just in case I'm working with multiple categories at the same time, because I can go and also say add maybe floors as well. So you can see that I can add multiple categories of elements because now we're going to filter these down. So at this point, I'm going to use another node and now I'm going to filter now that I have the reference objects. So I'm going to filter my reference objects by their attributes. I'm going to feed in this attribute here. Now the great thing about these two inputs on the filter attribute is that they're reverse engineerable. We can feed in a value list, which is actually going to receive the values backwards, which is really cool. So this gives us some context sensitive uh, aspects here we can work with. So if I feed this in, check it out, it adopts all the possible values. This is one of the reasons I really like using Grasshopper. It's just so user-friendly. Um, there's a lot of programs that don't have this sort of backwards logic in terms of how data can flow through the model. So really impressive, um, love this feature. I'm gonna just also add the same for the values. And then depending on whatever value I currently have nominated, for example, type, you can see that this value list also responds to all the possible values of that parameter. So now I can see that I've got my wall types. Let's say I just want to reference my 300 millimeter concrete walls. Now you can see that I'm isolating the reference to those elements. So let's turn off the preview for our user attribute elements. And now we can see I am actually just isolating those elements. It's super powerful. Now at the moment, we're still not selecting our Rhino element. So we are gonna to need to select these elements. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. We're gonna to have to run a Python script over these elements. So I'm gonna get the GUID of these elements. And I can't unfortunately iterate over GUIDs. So I can't run list functions in Python across them. They're non-iterable. What I can do is, I'm sorry, I just got a cat jumping all over my computer here. Um, anyway, I'm gonna turn these into text because what I can do is I can turn these into text and then inside an iteration loop, I can refer to these back as GUIDs. I found this solution on one of the Rhino forums. I believe it was someone called Willem or Wilhelm. So um, thanks to, um, to that person. Um, but in this case, I am just gonna rebuild that Python script. Now I've, I've changed the logic of the Python script a little bit because I wanted it to behave differently. So what I wanna do is whenever I go and make a change to one of these properties, I want it to reselect what I've currently nominated. So the way it worked before is as you selected things, it got fed into the node and more and more things got selected, which doesn't really work. I just want to select what I'm filtering. So in this case, my first um, Python script is actually uh, relatively straightforward. So I'm just going to quickly refer to that so I can see what I need to, what I need to reference in this case. Um, but I think, just checking it now, just to make sure I can see what, see what needs to be done. So the first one we're going to build is just a really basic Python script. All this does is deselect everything. So it resets my selection in Rhino. So at this point, I'm just gonna turn on my layers again, so I can see everything. I'm gonna turn off my filter by attributes so that we don't see the preview geometry. And now I'm just gonna double click and look for GH Python script. There's only one input to this Python script in this case. So in this case, um, we're just collecting a trigger. All this is here for is just to rerun the script if anything changes into its data flow. Um, in this case, I'm only gonna have one output as well. Um, in this case, I'll just leave it as out. And I'm just gonna double click on my Python script. Now in this case, I'm just gonna import a few things. I'm just gonna, I'll keep that stuff up the top, that's fine. So I'm gonna keep this import Rhino script syntax. I'm also gonna import Rhino and system. Just so I have the, uh, the references that I need. Don't know if I need both Rhino and System in this case, um, but I'll just use them anyway, because we're gonna call on the active document. And we're gonna go from Rhino, we're gonna get the Rhino document, and we're gonna get the active document. And now we're also just gonna call on the document. We're gonna get all the objects, and we're gonna unselect all of them. There's probably more efficient ways to do this. Um, this is probably a pretty brute force method. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna print true as my output. Now I believe that should be should be correct. And all that should be fed out of this is just an output of true. It doesn't actually have to be an output of anything, it just needs to run. But if I select something now, and let's say I just have a button that triggers a change. Well, essentially you can see that um, this essentially will just deselect everything. 
So what I can do now is just feed this through to something that changes. So how about I feed it through to my data? I'm just going to feed my data node through. So whenever that changes, it triggers the deselection process. Great. So we've done the first Python script and that one's not too hard. Um, this, the next one's a little bit more complicated if you don't know much Python. Now what I'm going to do is just copy this script because essentially it's going to have two things. So I'm just going to probably add an extra input above and I'm going to call this ID list. And I'm going to feed in this text as my ID list. And my trigger is going to be the output of my unselection node. This makes sure that everything is unselected. And then after that's finished, I reselect what gets fed through from the GUIDs. So I'm forcing an order of execution on these Python scripts every time they run. This one essentially depends on the unselection process running first. Okay, so in this case, it's going to be the same at the start. I'm just going to collect everything, including the active document, but I'm not going to unselect all, obviously. And instead, um, first of all, I'm going to take my text input and break it into a data list because at the moment it's just a big block of text. So I'm going to call this um, separate lines equals ID lists, which is sort of what the, the, the forum post was going through before. And I'm going to split it based on whether there's a line. So in this case, the line is represented as an escape character, N, which implies a new line in string format. I'm then going to iterate over this list of strings that are now broken apart, turn them into IDs and select those elements. So I'm going to go for string ID in separate lines. So I'm creating a local variable. So I'm going to run a for loop. Um, so make sure you indent this. I think automatically Grasshopper Python indents things, which is really friendly. So in this case, I'm firstly just going to say the object ID of that element that we want to select is going to be from system.guid. So we're referencing a GUID, which relies on a string. And then after that, I'm going to retrieve the, the runner object. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you call these variables. I'm just referring to the, the solution from the forums here. So I'm using the same variable names. So from our document, I'm going to obtain an object using the find command and that relies on the ID in this case. So that will return the object and finally we need to select it. So I'm going to refer to my objects I just created that I'm iterating through and I'm just going to select it and I'm going to select it with the input of true by selecting it. And I believe that should select the objects being fed through the node. So now whenever we change this value it's going to deselect everything and then finally it's going to receive this trigger and it's going to go and select all those elements. So that's pretty much it. Now I can say 200 concrete, 300 concrete. So you can see now we have a means of selecting and accessing elements in our Revit, in our Rhino model based on their Revit data. So it's sort of like a Rhino Revit hybrid now in terms of how we can access these elements. And obviously this can be used to source elements for computational workflows. For example, you could bring in the rooms using Rhino inside and then filter them by level, by department, by name. You could say, give me all my living rooms for a solar study. Um, the, the possibilities are fairly endless in this case. And I feel like it sort of cracks the code on bringing BIM into Rhino well and truly without relying on a two-way connection to always be present. So really powerful. Um, and I'm really excited to see what I can do with this in future. I'm sure there's gonna be some workflows on the channel that will depend on this type of workflow particularly in regards to solar and feasibility analysis, which is pretty much what this cracks wide open, in my opinion. So hopefully you've enjoyed this and it's given you a new tool for your arsenal if you're a Rhino user, or if you're a Revit user looking to join the Rhino community, but you don't quite have all the data that you usually wish you had as a Revit user, and now you do. Anyway, that, that's pretty much it. Um, so the data set for this will be on GitHub, which will include uh, the model that you'll need in order to run this study. And I'll, I'll probably include that in the previous tutorial uh, data set as well. Thanks for watching today. Um, if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.